In section 1.5, we're going to highlight some of the key features of inverse functions. We say that two functions f and g are inverses of each other if, when we look at f composed with g of x, that's equal to x for every x in the domain of g, and also if g composed with f of x is equal to x for every x in the domain of, of f. If these two functional equations hold true for all values of x, as just mentioned, then we say that the functions f and g are inverses, and we typically will denote g as f inverse with this, this notation right here. Okay. So to kind of summarize, two functions are inverses if you do the if you do the two compositions if they both work out to be equal to x. Let's take a look at example number one. They give us a function f and a function g. And they ask us to show that the two functions are inverses of each other. In order to do so, we need to check both compositions. Let's begin by looking at f composed with g of x. So we're starting with the outer function, which is f of x. And we're using as its input the function g. Let me just briefly copy down the statement form for the function f. f of x is defined as twice the input cubed minus 1, and what we're using for our input is going to be the function g of x, which is going to be the cube root of x plus 1 over 2. When you try and set out to attempt the two functions are inverses of each other, it's really important to show step-by-step -step algebraically how this works. The first thing we would notice is that in this composition, the cube root and the cube cancel so we get 2 times the quantity x plus 1 over 2 minus 1. The next thing to notice is that the multiplication by 2 and the division by 2 cancel. So we get x plus 1 minus 1. And now the plus 1 and the minus 1 cancel. And so we get x. That shows that f composed with g of x is equal to x. We also need to check the other composition. Let's now look at g of f of x. Now we're starting with the function g, and we're using as its input the function f of x. Let me begin by copying down the statement form for the function g. g of x takes the cube root of the input plus 1 divided by 2. What we're plugging into the function g is the function f, which is 2x cubed minus 1. And again, let's be very careful with our algebra here. The first thing that would happen is that in the numerator, the minus 1 and the plus 1 would cancel. So we're going to have the cube root of 2x cubed over 2. Next, the multiplication by 2 and the division of 2 cancel. So we get the cube root of x cubed. The cube root and the cubic function are inverses, so they cancel each other. And this would just give us x. So we checked both compositions, f composed with g of x and g composed with f of x, both equal to x. And what that tells us is that f and g are going to be inverses of each other. So f and g are inverses. And then usually what we would do in this circumstance is we would rename the function g. Instead of calling it g, we would refer to it as f inverse. If you're trying to check to see whether or not two functions have inverse each other, and if you do one of the compositions, if you get anything other than x, you can stop immediately and claim that those two would not be inverses. The next thing we want to look at is how do you find the inverse of a function given a, a function? Well, there's a, a three-step process to this typically. And the first step is to kind of revert back to the old school y notation. So wherever you see f of x, replace it with y. The second step is we're going to interchange the x and the y variables. 
And then at the next step, what you want to do is resolve that equation to re-get the y by itself. With the new modified equation solved for y, that actually will be your inverse function. Let's take a look at example 5. We're asked to find the inverse of f of x equals the square root of 7x minus 5. First thing we're going to do is revert back to our old notation. Let's call it y equals the square root of 7x minus 5. The next step is to interchange the x's and the y's. So we get x equals the square root of 7y minus 5. From here, we now want to resolve this equation for y, so we want to try to get the y by itself. To isolate the y, you would want to square both sides to get rid of the square root. This would say that x squared equals 7y minus 5. We're trying to solve for y, so we're now going to add 5 to both sides. Add 5. We get x squared plus 5 equals to 7y. And then we would now want to divide both sides by 7. And we find that y is equal to x squared plus 5 divided by 7. With this equation now solved for the variable y, because we did the interchange, this y is no longer the same thing as our initial y. This actually is the inverse function. So f inverse of x is going to be equal to x squared plus 5 divided by 7. And if you're unsure on this, you can certainly check this. Try and check and confirm that f composed with f inverse as well as f inverse composed with f both work out to give you x. It turns out that not every single function actually has a well-defined inverse. It's only those functions that are one-to-one -one that will have a, a true inverse. And in order to determine whether or not a function is one-to-one, -one, you can analyze its graph and use the horizontal line test. The horizontal line test says that as long as every horizontal line intersects the graph of a function in at most one point, then that graph would be a one-to-one -one function and will have an, an inverse. Conversely, if you can find any horizontal line that intersects the graph in more than one point, then that function is not going to be one-to-one -one and it will not have an inverse. As an example, here's a, a nice graph. If you look at the, the function that's in green, it's very kind of indicative of almost something like x cubed. This graph would pass the horizontal line test and therefore would have an inverse. So this function is one to one and it has an inverse. Alternatively, if you look at this parabola, this function fails the horizontal line test because you can find several, in particular, you can find at least one horizontal line that intersects the graph in at more than one point. So this graph is not one to one and therefore would not have um, an inverse. In example two, they give us these different functions and they ask us whether or not each one has an inverse. Probably the easiest way to, to answer this question is to graph each of these functions. And you can use your calculator or any kind of graphing applet. If you look at the function in example A, this is simply a translation of the basic function x cubed down one unit. This function would pass the horizontal line test and therefore it would have an inverse. If you look at the function in example B, Again, if you wanted to, you could use a graphing calculator or a graphing applet to, to kind of take a look at this one. What you would see is that the graph of this function looks something kind of like this. And this graph would actually fail the horizontal line test. 
there are several horizontal lines that are going to end up intersecting this graph in more than one point. Therefore, this function is not one-to-one. -one. It would not have an inverse.